Hello friends, I'm Sue. Thanks for joining me for today's Bible reading for December 7th. And starting a new book today, only two readings in this short book of Galatians. Today I'll be reading 1 through 3 and tomorrow 4 through 6. Now, if you've been following through, and be sure to go get the 2 Corinthians playlist and review it one more time. Um, it's just, if you want to, it's just a good way to go back and go over all the the readings from the book we just finished. And I like to do that, so I'm just uh, recommending that to you. But anyway, if you've been if you went through that, we saw how in First and Second Corinthians, Paul made a lot of corrections and many defenses of himself, his ministry, and the pure truth of the gospel. And he does more of that in this book, in this letter to the Galatians. So, um, he also clarifies just what that gospel is, that people, believers are made right with God through Jesus alone. Um, you'll see that he starts getting into a little bit about the law and, um, yeah, so that's just a little summary of what, what this book is about. So verse one through three, you'll see is a greeting from Paul to the church and also an admonition to the Lord Jesus. Verse 1, Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ, and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me, to the assemblies of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us out of this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that you are so quickly deserting him who called you into the grace of Christ to a different good news. But there isn't another good news. Only there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the good news of Christ. But even though we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you any good news other than that which we preach to you, let him be cursed. As we have said before, so I now say again, if any man preaches to you any good news other than that which you received, let him be cursed. For I am for am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? For if I were still pleasing men, I wouldn't be a servant of Christ. But I make known to you, brothers, concerning the good news which was preached by me, that it is not according to man. For I didn't receive it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came to me through revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my way of living in times past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the assembly of God and ravaged it. I advanced in the Jews' religion beyond many of my own age among my countrymen, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when it was the good pleasure of God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, to reveal his Son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I didn't immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia, then I returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Peter and stayed with him 15 days. But of the other apostles, I saw no one except James, the Lord's brother. Now about the things which I write to you, behold, before God, I am not lying. Then I came to the regions of Syria and Cilicia. I was still unknown by face to the assemblies of Judea, which were in Christ, but they only heard he who once persecuted us now preaches the faith that he once tried to destroy. So they glorify God in me. Then, after a period of fourteen years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus also with me. I went up by revelation, and I laid before them the good news which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately, before those who were respected, for fear that I might be running, or had run, in vain. But not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. This was because of the false brothers secretly brought in, who stole in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ, Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave no place in the way of subjection, not for an hour, that the truth of the good news might continue with you. But from those who were reputed to be important, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God doesn't show partiality to men. They, I say, who were respected imparted nothing to me. But to the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the good news for the uncircumcised, 
even as Peter with the good news for the circumcised. For he who worked through Peter in the apostleship with the circumcised also worked through me with the Gentiles. So Peter was called to the Jews, Paul to the Gentiles, is what he's saying. Well, he's saying that Peter worked with the circumcised. Let me be specific. And when they perceived that the grace that was given to me, James and Cephas and John, those who were reputed to be pillars, gave to Barnabas and me the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the Gentiles, and they to the circumcision. They only asked us to remember the poor, which very thing I was also zealous to do. But when Peter came to Antioch, I resisted him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before some people came from James, he ate with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. You know, after all these years of reading this, of course, I'm getting new things out of it and seeing new things. And so here you have Peter, one of the disciples of Jesus, um, you know, eyewitness of Jesus, saw him in his in his other realm, you know, when Jesus, well, after he resurrected, he saw him. It wasn't Peter there in the ascension. Um, Peter was there when, before Jesus uh, was crucified, when, um, when Moses and Elijah appeared to him, he saw him there. So think about this. And yet here's Peter who's falling into his insecurities, his fear of man and being a hypocrite as he's trying to walk his Christian walk. I mean, honestly, this is why Jesus said, forgive 70 times seven, because we just need to go easy on each other. You know, um, it's not okay that he did that. And I assume he repented when he was confronted by Paul, but still, I mean, wow, you know, the temptation, the pressure sometimes in society, especially their society with Rome and the Jews and the whole tension that, that was there between them. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to share that thought with you. He said, and the rest of the Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. Can you imagine how frustrated Paul must have been? That's his, his friend, sidekick Barnabas. So the, the Christians, the believers filled with the Holy Spirit, all of a sudden pulled away because of the fear of what the Jews would think of them associating with uncircumcised people. Unbelievable. So verse 14, Paul said, but when I saw that they didn't walk uprightly according to the truth of the good news, I said to Peter before them of all, no, before them all, if you being a Jew live as the Gentiles do and not as the Jews do, why do you compel the Gentiles to live as the Jews do? We being Jews by nature and not Gentile sinners, yet knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ, even we believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because no flesh will be justified by the works of the law. In fact, the law condemns us, right? Verse 17. But if while we sought to be justified in Christ, we ourselves also were found sinners, is Christ a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I build up again those things which, were, which I destroyed, I prove myself a lawbreaker. For I through the law died to the law that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. That life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. I don't reject the grace of God. For if righteousness is through the law, then Christ died for nothing. So basically, if you want to live by the law, you're going to be condemned by it, and you can never live up to it. So we set ourselves back under condemnation that Christ is in vain, right? So he's saying it's either, you know, choose, choose one or the other, choose life or death, choose faith in Christ if you want to live. So he says, um, he therefore who supplies the spirit to you and does miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law? or by the hearing of faith. Even so Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Know therefore that those who are of faith are children of Abraham. 
The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the good news beforehand to Abraham. See, he's showing that this existed, this faith for salvation existed before the law even came. It says, um, the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the good news beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you all the nations will be blessed. So then those who are of the faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many are, as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who doesn't continue in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. Now that no man is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous will live by faith. The law is not of faith, but the man who does them will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, does that say through wishful thinking? No. Sometimes we think faith is just, a, you know, hopeful. No, faith is something very unique and specific. It is a real and changeable thing. And always, always prove that by comparing it to hope. You know, if you see someone without hope, they're a completely different person than someone with hope. It can, not having hope can destroy you. It's a very real thing. Well, faith is the same way. And so we receive the spirit through faith. The real spirit through the real faith. Verse 15. Brothers, speaking of human terms, though it is only a man's covenant, yet when it has been confirmed, no one makes it void or adds to it. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his offspring. He doesn't say to descendants as of many, but as of one, to your offspring, which is Christ. Now I say this, a covenant confirmed beforehand by God in Christ, the law, which came 430 years after, does not annul so as to make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no more of promise, but God has granted it to Abraham by promise. Then why is there a law? It was added because of the transgressions, until the offspring should come to whom the promise has been made. It was ordained through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could make alive, most certainly righteousness would have been of the law. But the scripture imprisoned all things under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, confined for the faith which should afterwards be revealed so that the law has become our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Now see how Paul became an expert of going back into the scriptures, the Torah, the prophets, and others, the Psalms, um, and showing that Christ crucified was a mystery that had been there all along, hidden. And he just became an expert at pulling it out and showing it to people because, I'm sure, partly because he knew the law so well. He was so well schooled. And, you know, he said he was an expert in it. So that's what he's doing here. He's going showing how this promise to Abraham and then the law that was like a school teacher, you know, kept everything until this time when Jesus came and we could receive the promise by faith. So I hope you're following that. It's not always easy to tease out. Um, verse 24 again. So that the law has become our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you, excuse me, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring and heirs according to the promise. And that's it for the reading. But you see how he said it was Abraham's offspring, singular, who is Christ. And if we are in Christ, 
then we receive that promise by being in Christ. That's the importance of those in Christ realities. And you can look them up. You can do a study on that. The realities and the uh, the benefits, the inheritance we have in Christ, not of works, lest any man should boast, but by faith only. Isn't that fabulous? Praise God. I love it. One more reading from this book tomorrow. Please join me for it. Be sure to click the notification bell on the front of the YouTube next to the subscribe button. And until then, I'll see you next time. Peace to you.